<laughs> Mad Pop! He's actually controlling minds right now. And he knows what kind of response he's going to get. It's very simple, gentlemen. Either we're going to use the skills that we have to help better ourselves and our families, or we're going to take the skills that we have and think that all we can do is play basketball. And basketball is a beautiful sport. Like I said, I've, I've been playing sports my whole life. My whole life. I learned a lot through playing football. To me, a, a football was my release. Football to me was my release. I played quarterback in high school, played cornerback in college. I knew we, uh, in high school we had a 30-man roster. In college we had a 100-man roster. And I learned how to communicate with 100 people. Mm. I knew how to be within a group dynamic and still be an individual through playing football. I learned life lessons through the game of football. Hopefully we can learn life lessons, and that's why Sister Deneen, that's the reason she's having this tournament. Not necessarily to play basketball, which is a beautiful sport that we all love, but to learn some life lessons. That we can come from two different areas of, of, of the Rockaways and still get along. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about, well, this is my block. Well, this is my block. Think about it. How can you talk about this is your block when you're the master of the planet Earth? When you own 196,940,000 square miles of the planet Earth, and you're saying, this is my block. This is not your block. This is your planet Earth. When God said, let us make man, he didn't say, I'm going to make man for breaker. I'm going to make man for hammers. He said, I'm going to make man for the planet Earth. To give him rage and dominion. So we got to start expanding our thinking beyond the scope of our reality or our environment if we're going to be who God made us to be. So at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Lorenzo Steele, who's going to give you the second half of the presentation. And, and brothers, sincerely in my heart, I hope that we make decisions that's really going to make our communities better. Because at the end of the day, some of you that's 15 years old right now, in five years you'll be 20 years old and it goes like this. Some of you that's 25 right now, and in, 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 in 15 years, you'll be 40. And it goes like this. How much, what you going to put into your time? If you want to be a clown and a buffoon for the rest of your life, that's your decision. Because it's easy to be a buffoon, it's easy to be a clown. Very easy. All you do, I gotta do is crack a couple of jokes and have a couple of people laugh, and, and that's how you become what, what that is. But if you're gonna exercise the discipline over yourself and then master yourself, then you'll be able to go out in the community, master the community, so that the community can serve its people. So, with that being said, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your time, and Sister Deneen, I'd like to thank you for putting this together. That was great, My bro. name is uh, Lorenzo <laughs> Steele, Jr., and I'm a former New York City Department Correction Officer. From 1987 to 1999, I worked in the nation's most violent adolescent prison on Rikers Island called C-74. There was an article in the uh, Village Voice, Daily News, and the Post still calling Rikers Island C-74, still the most violent adolescent prison in the nation. Working there for those 12 years, there's things that I will never forget that has traumatized me for the rest of my life. These cuttings and stabbings, we used to average 50 to 60 of these a month. Young adolescents come into prison, 14 to 21 years old, wind up getting scarred up like that because they made a choice to be a gangster or a thug. They made a choice not to listen to their parents, and they chose to listen to the streets. Working behind those walls, I was 21 years old. When I was a correction officer, I weighed 159 pounds. C-74, you have adolescents and you have adults. One day you work with the adolescents, one day you work with the adults. Imagine how I felt 159 pounds, still a child, working with grown inmates, sometimes 330 pounds, 6'4". And you could never show fear behind those walls. There were days I was so scared, but you just can't show no fear. 
Because you got to realize, man, everybody know that inmates get violated in jail. But y'all don't even realize the psychological effects it have on officers. You have officers that went on OJT. That means, you know, um, you leave the academy, you go into the jail for two or three days. I can't do this. I didn't know jail was like this. There ain't no handbook on jail. Ain't no manual. When you get into jail, here you go, young man. This is how you conduct yourself behind the walls. Read the manual. Ain't no manual. The stuff gets made up as you go on. I seen adolescents in prison coming through with misdemeanors, taking 25 and sometimes 50 years upstate, catching jail cases right behind those walls. Imagine coming through on a misdemeanor. Judge tell you you just there for four months, or you just there because your moms can't make bail. And you wind up catching felonies because you have to cut and stab just to survive in jail. So it got to the point where I grew up listening to Public Enemy and KRS-One. The music was different back then. There wasn't cursing. You didn't see no half-naked women. And nobody was glorifying the hood. Public Enemy taught me about African history, about Egyptian history, about the pyramids, how we built the black, how black people built the pyramids. I learned that listening to KRS-One. If you love hip hop, go to the beginning of the music. You got YouTube right now. Listen to KRS One, Public Enemy, talking about fight the power, fight the machine. Talking about how the government is bringing in drugs to the community. This is what's going on. So this, I, I came through listening to this music. Never been to jail. I grew up in Cambridge Heights, Queens. That's where I grew up. Ain't know nothing about jail. Nobody in my family went to jail. Nobody on my block went to jail. I didn't even see the police until I was 16 years old. So I'm cast into a system. I'll never forget the first day we had to take the inmates to the mess hall to, to feed them. 400 inmates coming into an area this size. And I'm looking around. I'm like, ain't nothing but black and Hispanic people in there. Where the white people? I know they commit crime. But we're there at? So I'm like, wait a minute, something's going on. So now you get caught up into the, into the job. Into the job. Listening to KRS Public Enemy forced me to pick up a book to find out what, what, what were they talking about slavery? What happened during slavery? See, we forgot our history. That's why I put that right here. See, we forgot about this part of history right here. These are slave shackles. Slave shackles that they used to put on our ancestors so they could come over here and work for free. These are baby slave shackles. So when you see those images on TV that some video guy or some, um, some person put together, they never show you the baby shackle. They never show you the woman shackle getting beat. So there's a lot of stuff they don't show us that we don't know, that we forgot. So now, Supposedly, 1865, supposedly, they freed the slaves. But think about this, economically. All that free money that was made for 400 years. Would you really want to stop that money from coming in? That's right. No. That. You won't want to stop that. So we're going to change this thing around. <laughs> so now we're going to start building the prison system, prison industrial complex. How many people have here seen the movie Life with Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence? I'm the that movie, you had a little, you had a little buffoonery in it. You had a little buffoonery in it, but you had a lot of history in it too. Because after slavery, you had to keep this thing going. I'm gonna give y'all some homework to do. You need to, you need to do some research on what they call the convict leasing program. Because after slavery, when they supposedly freed the slaves, now the slaves was running around. They didn't have a place to live. So now, by law, they put laws on the book, so if you ain't have a place to live, we can lock you up. So this is what they was doing. This replaced, the prison, this replaced slavery. This thing is a business, fellas. This thing is a business, and it's not going anywhere. I'm gonna take you. These are jobs right here. These 72 prisons upstate. This thing is a business. 
So what it really means is these people can keep their job for 20 years, for 30 years, and get a check because somebody want to break the law. I got a check two times a month because somebody wanted to come to jail. I did 12 years getting a check two times a month because somebody wanted to come to jail. My kids were in private school. I had my own apartment at 22 years old. Money was real good, meaning people wanted to come to jail. My brother is an NYPD sergeant. He investigates police. He made his 20th year a couple months ago. Somebody go, Vic, you gonna retire? For what? I got two girls going to college, and I got five houses. Money is good. For what? I got two girls going to college, and I got five houses. Money is good. See, I don't see this side of it. Money is good. So when we harass in the streets, sometimes you gotta think sometimes. Did I really do anything wrong? Or that officer needs overtime. Did I really do anything wrong? And I feel your pain because I got stopped one day and I never forget it. Two o'clock in the morning, I should have been home. Wrong. Sitting in the car on my cell phone. Car off. Car pulled up. Cop did like this. Oh, you want to do now? So I said, Sir, can I help you? Um, do you live here? No. And I kept talking on the phone. Get the hell off the phone. I'm like, yo, who you talking to? You? Get the hell off the phone. So I'm like, sir, my brother's on the job. I don't give a damn. What's that, man? In 1900, you had 57,000 prisoners in America's jails. 1940, the number went up to 165,000. 1980, this is when I was in high school, there were 329,000 prisoners in America's jail. Now, watch this. From 1980 to 2000, the number jumped from 329,000 to 1.3 million. What happened between 1980 and 2000? Crack cocaine released in our communities. Crack cocaine wiped out a whole generation. So this thing is real, fellas. And it's not gonna go anywhere until we change ourselves. Yo, um, yo, is, is my son all right in school? I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, you wondering who's taking care of your son in the street? You can't even go to your mother and father's funeral that passed. You washing somebody's dirty underwear behind those walls, but nobody's going to tell you those stories. But some of these are stories that these young kids need to hear, man. Because they really think that jail is, is, is the place to be, man. Jail is the last place on earth that you ever want to be. And like I said before, you got officers that can't even survive it. So we need to think about that when we're making choices and decisions.